Everybody, this is week five of our Bible study about why the Temple Mount matters. Today, our message is about the throne in heaven coming to the earth. So I'm going to pray before we get started. Holy Spirit, I'm asking, would you come? Would you anoint me to um, share what you put on my heart to share? I pray that you'd anoint the hearing of the things we're going to talk about and that the truth of what um, you've given me to share would go deep into our hearts and help us to come around to your way of thinking about what you're doing right now in Israel, what you're doing right now in the Church of America, what you're doing right now in our individual hearts, our families, in our churches, in our cities. And I pray that you would um, help us take the next step forward with you into the return of Yeshua. In his name we pray. Amen. Okay, item one. Yeshua lives to make continual intercession. Jesus is literally continually praying. So this is this has implications for us. Like that that can there's several passages today that I felt like the Holy Spirit wanted me to highlight. This is not like holy poetry. It's not, you know, Bible prose that's supposed to make us feel like, oh, heaven is beautiful. This is really practical. And th this is what I mean. If you're part of Jesus's body and Jesus is making continual intercession, you should be too. Like we should be praying Always, as as his body. Now, I'm not talking individually. Like, I'm not talking about being a monk and walking around trying to connect with God all day long, though that is not a bad uh, thing to shoot for, is to abide in the Lord individually. But as the body of Messiah, we're supposed to abide in the Lord as well. So when you see, when Jesus tells his disciples in John 15, abide in me and I'll abide in you, he wasn't talking to them individually. You might hear it that way if you have a Western mindset. If you think about the world from a Western perspective, and specifically an American perspective, where your whole life you've been taught, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, individualism is freedom, is what the country's founded on, me, my 10 acres, my house, far away from neighbors, that is a Western mindset that's got very little to do with the context that Jesus was teaching a community of people to be his body, learn how to get along with God and then get along with each other. So when you hear Jesus say, abide me and I'll abide in you, he's talking about a corporate reality in addition to an individual reality. You can't do it corporately if you don't do it individually, but you can't just do it individually. That's the point. If you want to abide in Jesus, you have to abide in his body as well. So Jesus is continually praying. That means if you're really part of his body, you've got a vision for continually praying with other people in his body as well. Now, this is not taught in modern church circles for the most part. This is this seems like a new information to us, mostly because we don't understand the Jewish roots of our faith. We don't understand that this is actually something, even to this day, I could go across town and I could find Jewish people praying corporately, night and day, both at the Western Wall and at the Tomb of David. There's people there all the time, and they often pray antiphonally and to music. Okay, and so this is because this is in the DNA of what our faith grew out of. And we're not, we're not supposed to be haughty and think, okay, well, God's done with all that Jewish stuff. We're supposed to be humble and recognize the root we're grafted into and then put our relationship with God in that context and ask him about these things, okay? So this is what I'm suggesting to you is if you're not part of a company of people, a corporate group of people that are trying to pray more and more hours of the day, in, not because they do more, but because God is arranging more unity in the body and more death of self and more sanctification, you really need to ask the Lord, am I concerned about the same things you're concerned about? And, and I want to tell you, the Bible bears out that you're probably not. That's not something that you're, that when you hear about it, you're not, you're not provoked to find out. Is this what Jesus wants? If you're, if you're, when you hear about it, if what your flesh says is, do I have to do that? You have to recognize you're going away from God, not towards him. And I found this out the hard way. In 2011, I started to find out about this. I, it sounded weird to me. I didn't really want to be any part of it until I started to ask the Lord, Lord, is this of you? And then I realized I'd been living a lot of my life trying to find out how far I could go from God and still be all the way is. I was always kind of pulling on the leash of a relationship with him. And when I found out about this, and it all changed for me. I started to find out how close to him I could get. We want to be in a, in a relationship with God where we're trying to get as close to him as possible. So night and day prayer isn't a have to. It's a get to. Okay. Now, Hebrews 7, 24 to 26. But he, speaking of 
Yeshua or Jesus, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Now, this means that what he does, he will do forever. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost. That's good news that he has an unchangeable priesthood. That means you're going to need him to be a priest forever and ever and ever. And that's going to make you into the, connect you and grow you into the person you were always supposed to be forever and ever and ever. Your life is not going to be boring connected to Jesus. You're going to be learning, gazing on his beauty, beholding and becoming forever. And that you want that, okay? It says, therefore, he's able to say to the uttermost, to the inner, 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 innermost, into the outer, 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 outermost, to the uttermost, okay? Those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So you'd be like, well, what is Jesus praying for all the time? Is he praying for world peace? Is he praying for the climate? No, he's praying for you all the time. And this is what he said to Peter. Just before he went into the to, went to the cross in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said to Peter, Peter, Satan's asked to sift you like wheat. And I'm praying for you that your faith won't fail. And then he invited Peter to pray too, to be part of Jesus's body. And Peter denied him in the praying way before he denied him in front of other people. So we want to ask the Lord, am I denying you some part of my heart when I don't rearrange, let you rearrange my life to do this with you? Okay, because if this is what you're always doing and I'm imagining that I want to be with you all the time, that's what I would be doing, too. If he's always making intercession and I'm hanging out with him, then I'd be interceding, too. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate, sanctified from sinners and has become higher than the heavens. So if you're with Yeshua. Now, this is very interesting that he is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become anything. It's, it's amazing that Jesus has become anything, right? But he decided in the, the Godhead council to become flesh, and he was incar incarnated as a baby. And then he had to learn stuff and he had to choose, make faith choices. And he says, he said in John 17, I sanctify myself that they may be sanctified. He's holy, harmless, and undefiled. That means that if we want to be with him, we have to have a reach similar to his for these very same things. That's what the tabernacle of David is for. The tabernacle of David and the way Jesus lived a sanctified life, the way he's always making intercession. So when you see that, when it says he always lives to make intercession, that's before he was incarnated as a baby as well. He's He's unchanging. He's without a shadow of turning. He is God. All things were made by him. He's been interceding in creation forever. He was interceding, making intercession before, and he'll be making intercession after. So if we want to be in him and with him in that, we have to recognize his pattern of sanctification is an internal pattern, not an external pattern. In fact, in Luke 17, it said that the Pharisees asked him, how are we going to know your kingdom's coming? He says they were testing him. And he told them, you're way wrong. The kingdom doesn't come in a way as to be seen because the kingdom is within you. It's about what's happening in here. So the tabernacle of David is about what's happening in here. The way Jesus lived was about what's happening in here. He's a king starting inside of his heart because he completely submitted himself to the leadership of the Father. Okay, This is what we have to recognize. If you're going to be a priest and a king, if you're going to be joined to him, then you got to get into the government. That means you got to get into the intercession of Jesus. And if you do it now, he'll make you a leader in it for a thousand years with him. But if you won't do it now, you definitely won't be part of the first resurrection and leading with him for a thousand years. Now, this isn't holy poetry, this Hebrews 7, 24 to 26 passage. It's a personality description of Yeshua and all of us who want to be one with him. Okay, So Ephesians 4, 13 to 16 expounds on this even more. Till we all come. Now, this is speaking of the gift, the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the establishment of apostolic leadership, apostle, pastor, prophet, teacher, evangelist. Those are given until this happens, okay? Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Till we come to a place where we're joined to him because we know what he's doing. And what he's doing is making intercession continually. To a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, if you hear my words in the flesh and you hear me saying, He's making intercession continually. You're thinking he's in a prayer meeting continually. But that's not what I'm saying. In fact, we know that he's not in a prayer meeting continually because he came and visited with people and spoke to them, which I guess technically is a prayer meeting. But he's not in a formal prayer. This is happening. This is happening. He's interceding in the way creation is growing forever. And he does that in a very specific way called the government or the kingdom of God. Okay, So you have to understand our flesh interprets these things all boring. 
But the spirit interprets these things as life, as, as creative, life-giving, exciting, like an adventure with God forever. That's what Adam and Eve were experiencing before the fall of man. They were actually a part of this intercession. And then we'll get to that in the notes. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. But Adam and Eve were doing this when they were first created and with God. In fact, they were naming animals in a prayer meeting with the Father, and life was being framed by what man said, even though God made it. Like that's an amazing partnership that God would create something and let man name it, even knowing how much power there is in a name and how much power there is in words when we're partnering with God creatively and in his leadership. Okay, so this is what Ephesians is describing about us growing up into this unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro. Now, children are self-centered. They are, they only know their reality. They haven't matured enough to find out what other people are thinking and what other people are feeling and what other people want to do. But the, he's saying, uh, Paul's saying in, in Ephesians 4, 13 to 16, that we're supposed to grow out of that. We're supposed to mature to the point where we're about our father's business. That's what happened when Jesus was 12. He became about his father's business. He's, he told his parents, didn't you know I'd be here in the temple about my father's business? That's what was supposed to happen to us. We're supposed to mature into the same reality where we're like, I care about the temple because I care about the government. I care about the kingdom. I care about what my father cares about. I want to be about his business. How do I do that from where I'm at right now? And he will go lead us closer and closer and closer to the physical manifestation of that reality, which will mostly start appearing on the earth in the millennial reign of Jesus when he rebuilds the temple. Okay, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men. And you have to know the trickery of men happens by appealing to your flesh, telling you things that you want to hear, that, that the enemy already knows you want to hear, to get you to think the whole kingdom is about you. And that's how we all start. We all start thinking salvation is about us, but then we have to mature into realizing Oh, we're not our own. We're bought with a price. We're saved into something much bigger than ourselves. Okay. And that's how we get solid. But uh, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ, from whom the whole body joined in it together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working. Now, I just want you to have the word in your mind. Order. Jesus, his entire ministry is to bring order, the order of heaven, to something where Satan had corrupted a perfect order and gotten man in his own arrogance to break the order and think that they were making it. That's the Tower of Babel was a ridiculously lawless attempt to do something only God could do, which was bring order to people. And they tried to do it by getting the same language and the same speech. We have to recognize Jesus has an entirely different kind of order that he wants us to be a part of, but it is an order. It is actually unselfish is what that means. It's something somebody else directs, not you. From whom the whole body joined in it together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. And this is how your body works as well. Your body, you can look at the way your body is unified and works and has all this intricate, in, intricate individuality, but is part of the same thing. And every part is supposed to do its part. My index finger it wouldn't be a good eye and my eye wouldn't be a good index finger, but both of them are supposed to be in an order that's directed by my head. Jesus's body is this exact same way and it manifests in a worship order. And you can read about this. Once you see it in the Bible, you can't unsee it. You will see that kings that did this were called good kings. Kings that neglected this were called evil kings. Paul taught the pouring out of the Spirit is for the order of a church meeting, which Jesus is going to take and present to his Father as orderly and acceptable to God. So we have to recognize we're supposed to be getting more governed by God over time. If you're not, you're actually not part of the redemption process. Now, right now, Yeshua is waiting for his body to grow up into the head. When this happens, Jesus will join everything in heaven to everything in earth, and this will bring perfection back to creation. So when you see the war in Israel with Hamas in Gaza, when you see the famines that are happening, when you see the pestilence, when you see the war in the Ukraine, when you see the hatred that's growing in the U.S., you see the anti-Semitism that's growing, you see the murder that's growing, the drug addiction that's growing, the sexual sin that's growing, the answer to that is an order that comes from the kingdom of God manifesting on the earth. But 
Christians typically get impatient about this and want to impose their own idea of order on the world around us instead of letting the kingdom order us from the inside out. And until we do that, it's going to get worse because God is not going to let anyone share the glory of his son. His son paid for, he paid the ticket for the complete restoration. He said, it's finished. And he's waiting for us to voluntarily decide to get into his governmental order, which is a worship order, so that he can start manifesting his leadership over all of creation forever and ever and ever to order it and establish it. And it will never stop increasing. Okay, and I'll show you that passage in just a second. Okay. So uh, when this happens, Jesus will join everything uh, in heaven to earth. And this will bring perfection back to creation. This is Ephesians 1, 4 to 12. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption. That's, a, that's actually a form of order. As sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. His will is what orders are. To the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. So we are already accepted into this order. We don't order ourselves to get into the, the beloved, okay? So we actually get into the beloved and let it order us. That's the only way it could work. If it didn't work that way, Jesus wouldn't have died on the cross. He just looked for people that were willing to be self-controlled and determined, and then he'd add them to his order. But that's not what he wants. He wants people that are weak and broken to admit they're weak and broken and say, okay, God, how do you order a mess like this? And he's like, let me show you. It is glorious. It is enjoyable. It is pleasurable. And it is full of fruitfulness, not just for you, but for your family, your church, your city, and the whole world. Okay. So it's, it's a great thing that he's made us accept, accepted in the beloved before we're ordered through the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in all in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven. So when you read Revelation 4, you're reading about something in heaven and on the earth. When you read about the tabernacle of David, you're reading about what's happening in Revelation 4, also happening on the earth. He wants to bring the temple in heaven and the tabernacle in earth together. And then all that will be needed is the worship order. And there won't be a need for a temple because everyone will be accepted in the beloved that, that makes it through this process in truth and in love. And they will be a part of a, of a governmental system which will order all of the worlds that we're from. So when you look at the galaxies, you'll just look at the Milky Way on a clear night. And you're like, man, there's billions of stars. There are worlds yet to be ordered, according to the Bible, worlds that were framed by faith that we are going to be responsible for bringing order to forever. It's, it's very exciting. Look, I mean, we have not asked or imagined. We have no idea. We haven't imagined how amazing what God, it's better than the best movie you've ever seen. It's better than the best expression of emotion you've ever felt. It's, it's more united, more loving, more cooperative, more creative than anything you could imagine. And that's what you're invited into. And it starts with letting your soul, your mind, will, and emotions be ordered by a worship movement that's already happening in heaven. You just are joined to it. And that's called the tabernacle of David. Okay. So that in the dispension, dispensation of the fullness of times. Now, I just feel like the Holy Spirit's telling me to share this with you. When most people get into the prayer movement, the, the prayer to music movement, they actually make it about performance instead of order. What matters is order. Performance will increase and improve forever. But if you don't get the order, if you don't get the, the authority, the lawfulness of it, that you could be an amazing musician and actually be antichrist in your operation in God's government. You could actually be an enemy of the cross of Christ, even though you're walking with a bunch of people who are trying to get ordered by God just because you're trying to be good at something that people can see. You don't want to let that replace the order. It's way more important to be lawful and under authority and let God increase your skill than try to be skilled and ignore all the order and the authority that's required. Okay, That's what Satan did. Satan is a very skilled, very skilled worship leader, but he ignored the authority and he broke everything. So we're, God has given us Yeshua to follow to get us out of that chaos and, and, and destruction, that theft. Okay. Um, 
So he's going to bring together verse uh, 10 of Ephesians 1. All things in Christ, both which are heaven and on the earth, are in him. In him we've also in obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose. You find the order, you'll find the destiny. Being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. So what that means in layman's terms is that when you say yes to this process, we can trust Jesus to lead us in the order of this process and that we will become complementary to what he's doing. When people look at what, what God does through us, they'll give glory to the Father. That's what that means. Again, this is not holy poetry. This passage has a very practical meaning and application. Those who are truly in Christ learn to live to make continual intercession. That's You could boil this all down to what is Jesus doing right now? And I want to be a part of it. And if I'll just say yes to that, even though I am not good at it, even though I'm not skilled at it, I can be I can be taught the order. I'm already accepted in the beloved. I'm already accepted in the body. And as I function, I'll get better at doing it. That's the way a baby learns how to walk. That's a learn, the way a baby learns how to eat. That's the way a baby learns how to talk. That's the way every human body gets good at anything, <laughs> is just practicing. And that's what this is actually saying, that if you do it, it's predestined. You will be a praise to his glory. Like you'll be evidence of his glory. Okay. Your internal, eternal inheritance is only found in the kingdom, which is established in continual intercession. God intercedes continually. To be one with him means you have a vision for being a part of that body or family. You are only predestined to the degree that you allow yourself to be. Your destiny it's predetermined if you if you obey the Father's leadership by the still small voice of the Spirit in faith. It's guaranteed to work, but the degree to which it will work on you depends on how much you are willing to believe it and do it. Okay, this is a very narrow road. If you believed it and did it, you'd spend all of your time asking and receiving more from God. If you ask and receive with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, and learn to have confidence in God's generosity. He will do something with you that you would not imagine. He will take a person completely lost in their own self-leadership and sin and reorder them and make them leaders in his kingdom. And we can see that he's done this with many people throughout history. He did it with Peter. He did it with Paul. He, when Paul was literally killing Christians, he was, he was completely turned against God. And God took him and ordered him and set him as an apostle and a, and a founder of the church. I mean, it's amazing what God did. And this is for you too. Uh, you're, this is a very narrow road though. This is the kingdom, which is only seen by those born of the spirit. You can't see this in the flesh. Okay. So how do we know if we're in this order? There's only one way to know. It's not because we walk into a meeting and this person's on the piano and this person's here at a prayer station. They wait for one and that person waits for the person and that person waits for the person. That is a glimpse in the flesh of that order. But the way you know you're in the order that God's talking about is you're bearing the fruits of the Spirit more and more and more as you deal with more and more of the kingdom, more and more people. You're, you, have, you grow in your capacity to worship God with other people and manifest this very same personality that Jesus had with a bunch of people that did not understand what was happening. They did not know him. They thought they were experts at stuff they weren't. And he... He literally lived in a certain way, described in Isaiah 42, as meek and lowly, okay? And so that's what we're going for. We're going for the same fruit. Now listen, Matthew 7, 7 to 23. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. And what this is saying is make continual intercession. Ask the Father and he'll give you stuff. Look for stuff from him. You'll find it. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Guaranteed, there's, he's no respect for persons. All who seek, find. You could literally be in a different religion. And if you start asking the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to show himself to you, he will do that and take you out of that religion. He found all of us outside of his kingdom. And he's willing to bring anyone, willing to find out the truth at cost of their flesh. He's willing to bring any of us into his kingdom. Okay. Uh, or what man is there who among you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate, 
For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go and by. Most people will never find this narrow road that you can only see by the Spirit. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are a few who find it. Now, what is this narrow road? It's continual intercession. It, it, it says it actually in this passage, if you pay attention. It's actually, it says, therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also for them. So if we go back, if you go back up in the notes and you look at this passage where it talks about Yeshua, uh, the very first passage, Hebrews 7, it says he's holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and he's become higher than that. That means he's really enjoyable to be around. He's a good friend. He cares about other people more than himself. You know, we can see that just by him going to the cross. So when you see, therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. What that means is, you have to change and become a selfless person. That's the narrow road. The narrow road is asking and receiving God to change you into a person who's actually enjoyable and without guile and loving to other people. Loving people, they don't parade themselves. They don't demand their own way. They believe all things. They hope all things. They endure all things. They forgive their enemies. They bless those who curse them. They, they pray for those who spitefully use them. They are generous with their money. He's, that's what this is saying is this is the narrow gate of self change, but not because you grit your teeth and change, because you asked and received. Okay. And then he says, uh, this is Jesus speaking, narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and error if you can find it, because it's death to your pride. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. They look like people that are actually doing this, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. You'll know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes? If you see somebody who's selfishly ambitious, that's a false witness of Jesus's personality. You see somebody who's not generous, false witness of Jesus's personality. You see somebody that parades themselves, that's a false witness of Jesus's personality. You see somebody that doesn't forgive their enemies, they, they actually teach other people to hate, you know, Palestinians or the Hamas guys or that enemy over there or this enemy over here or Israel or... That's a false witness. You don't want to be any part of that. You want to be a part of people like Jesus. Jesus is seeking and saving the lost. He is considering others better than himself. He is uh, only listening to what the Father's doing. And he does all that by asking and receiving. Okay. You'll know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. That only happens by asking and receiving. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied your name? So you'd be like, okay, they're being prophetic. Maybe. But are they bearing the fruit of people that hang out with God in the order of the authority of the tabernacle of David? Are they humble? Are they meek? Are they lowly? Are they recognizing their own need for change? Or are they telling God how everybody else needs to change? Are all their prophecies about what everybody else should do? Or are their prophecies about them changing? Are their prophecies about being more conformed to the leadership of Jesus? We've cast out demons in your name. We've done many wonders in your name. There's going to be a false witness of all these things. And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice order. No. The exact opposite of order, lawlessness. See, the whole point is authority. That's the point of your life right now, is to learn how to get back into the government of God, back into the authority of God, back into the right spirit and truth worship of God, so that God can release his glory through you into creation to order it and establish it forever. Lawlessness equals antichrist, or humanistic replacement of the goodness in Jesus Christ. The only goodness that the earth will ever see is found in Jesus Christ. Lawfulness equals, so lawlessness is antichrist. It's a humanistic replacement. It's, it's a non-spirit-led attempt to be good for God instead of to die to ourselves and let God be good through us. Lawfulness equals being in the kingdom or government. It's just order. I keep saying order because there's a very specific order that David was shown by the Father that changed the creation when he was king of Israel. Jesus is going to rule and reign in this exact same way. David was a, a picture of this so that we could see how a man agreed with God about this order. Okay. 
So uh, this kingdom operates in a bottom-up reality, not a pyramid, not a top-down reality. The bottom-up reality, it's manifest where the greatest become becomes a servant. That's what Jesus did. He's God, and he came, became weak, became flesh, a baby, learned things, sanctified himself so that we could be sanctified, and then served everybody that he called to himself. He even washed their feet. This has massively practical realities attached to it. This means that everything grows in the kingdom from the root up, not the top down. It's never looking, the kingdom of God is never looking for a group of people to gather together, get one vision, and go do that thing for God. It's, it's never that way. It, and most of the church thinks it is. You have to come out of that and you have to recognize. When you read about people in the Bible, you're never reading about that. You'll never see that. Even with Moses, even when Moses led a multitude out of Egypt, it was Moses was very alone in his leadership for a lot of the story of Moses leading the people of Israel out of out of Egypt. You have to recognize it's just different. It grow everything in the kingdom grows from the root up. Asking God is the only way of receiving the kingdom, and that means all of it. The only action plan Jesus gave his disciples was intercession, prayer. And abiding. These are all the same thing. That's the only thing Jesus ever told his disciples to do. Even when he said, go into all the earth, make disciples of men, teach them all these things. He said, but wait, first go into the upper room and tarry until the promise of the Father comes. And then they, those disciples taught other disciples to pray. It was always only a prayer movement. It's always only a talking to God, God talking to us movement. It was never a let's go do something amazing for God and then we'll learn how to talk to him later. It was always a, let's learn how to talk to him. He's going to lead us to do something with us, creative and through us that we don't really even understand, which is what we were talking about last, last week. Now, no other God does this. No other idol that the nations have ever had is like this. God is so unique this way. No other God gives to those who ask. All other gods, little g gods, require strength from man's hand, just like all earthly governments do. No government can give you anything you didn't give to it first. Like that's just a principle of the finiteness of the created. But the uncreated is infinite. Okay. So no other God has an infinite store of he speaks things into existence in abundance and then shares them with people who simply ask for them. All other gods, they need man's strength to exist. Just like all other three governments. Idols cannot move themselves, talk, answer, or help. They can't provide but must be provided for. You can see people offering things to false gods because they need it. They, they don't exist without that. But God exists whether we give him anything or not. God is entirely different than this. Nothing moves, lives, breathes, or exists apart from his generosity and ability. Our worship, now this is the most important thing I'm going to say in this whole message. Our worship and participation in his government, it has to reflect this reality. We don't worship God because he needs worship. We worship God because it connects us to the conduit of his abundance. That's why we worship. He doesn't, he doesn't need to be told he's amazing. He knows it. He, he doesn't need anything. He, when we worship him, we plug into him and his resources start to flow into us. Okay. So our worship and participation as government must reflect this reality. Acts 17, 24 to 29. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. So you have to remember, God's not going to, he will not dwell in a temple made by man. He refuses to. Nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he, is ma he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grow up for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him, we live and move and have our being. If he's, if you have a heartbeat, God is there. You don't have a heartbeat without him. If you have breath in your lungs, God is involved in your life already. If you can humble yourself and realize that, you can run right into him right now. That's what the thief on the cross did with Jesus. He, he didn't need a 12-point discipleship program. He didn't need to go through all the courses, do all the study. He didn't need to be taught the tabernacle of David. He humbled himself and connected directly. Now, he's doing the tabernacle of David right now, though, because of that. So in heaven right now, that thief on the cross, he's part of a worship order that is like the tabernacle of David, but is, exists in the heavenly realm. He's in the Revelation 4 throne room of God. But he didn't do that because God needed it. He connected to his need for God and 
worship Jesus on the cross, and he was put into that. Okay, so that's this is the most important thing I can say. Uh, for in him we live and move and have our being, and as also some of your poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something to be shaped by art and man's devising. God will only live in a tent or temple of his own design and creation. Psalm 127, 1 to 2. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It's vain for you to rise up early and sit up late to eat the bread of sorrows, for he gives his beloved sleep. What this means is that the house of prayer is not an overwork. It's not like, okay, I'm going to have to get rid of this stuff and grip my teeth and really show up and do a lot of work so that God gets what he needs from the earth. That is a false iteration of the tabernacle of David. The house that God finds acceptable is a gift he gives to mankind as a place for us to come and open our hearts to him, knowing we're accepted in the beloved, but not good. Not perfect. It's got nothing to do with our skill. It's got to uh, it's got to do with us wanting to just come into his order as weak little kids that don't know how to walk yet. And he teaches us over time to move in coordination with other people who are trying to do this same worship order. And he, it's like a washing machine. It makes us clean so that we can live with him forever. God only accepts worship intercession in a kingdom that grows from him, not from us. Anything less than this is unfitting for him. It is related to his identity as a father, provider, banner. All the names of God, so Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, El Roy, these are all crowns that God wears. He has many crowns. He has many identities that he demands he be God of. Okay, And if you find the names of God, you find the crowns of God. God's government is consistent with his glory. Adam 2 on the notes. God needs no resources, worship, or prayer. He doesn't need any of that stuff. He's secure, sustained, and satisfied in himself. Worship, prayer, and sacrifice, or fasting, or giving up of our resources or our strength, what that does is it connects us to his source of supply. That's like the way we plug in. We plug in by gazing at who he is, seeing he's generous, asking him and receiving, and then getting rid of our natural strength because it's a hindrance to us actually putting all of our trust in him. So when you see sacrifice, that's what you're seeing. You're seeing a, a form of fasting. You're seeing a giving away of natural strength. That's why he wants the first fruits. That's why he wants the tithe. He wants it so that we connect to the fact that he is the resource provider of all these things to us. Okay. So Psalm 89, 13 to 17, doesn't need our money just so you're clear on that. He he wants our heart, but he won't take it. The way we give it to him is this way. Psalm 89, 13 to 17. Now, if you really touch this, this will change worship for you. It will make worship really enjoyable. When you realize you're there to give yourself to God so that he can give himself to you, it becomes supernatural. It becomes prophetic. It becomes tingly and alive and real and life-changing, heart-changing. I've never walked into a real worship meeting and walked out the same ever. And, and it, by definition, you couldn't because everybody who comes before God for real, they fall out down like a dead person. They're aware of their own need. They're aware of their own sin. Isaiah said, I'm a man of unclean lips. God touched him with a coal and then sent him into the next thing. So you should always be being changed by the prayer meetings that you go to. Now, we're Obviously, we're not always changed by them, but that that doesn't mean that God wasn't available. It means we didn't actually connect with him. So I've gone to lots of prayer meetings where I didn't change. What I'm saying is the ones where I went and actually worshiped, I changed. That's how you know. That's how you know you actually went and did the Tabernacle of David is you changed while you were there. Okay. And after, ever after. Um, Psalm 89, 13 to 17. You have a mighty arm, strong as your hand and high as your right hand. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. That means the call to prayer. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. In your name they rejoice all day long, and in your righteousness they are exalted. For you are the glory of their strength, and in your favor our horn is exalted. Now, some translations, they say, blessed are the people who hear the call to worship or hear the call to prayer. That's the joyful sound. For some of us, prayer is boring. For some of us, prayer is like an opportunity to fill back up and get everything we need to endure in love what God is going to do next. Okay, Worshiping and conversing with God takes us out of our self-leadership and brings us back into our eternal source. You're going to need a source of life forever. In a million years, you're going to need something or someone to keep you alive, fed, engaged. 
you know, creative going forward, you're going to need God for this forever. He made us because he wants to provide for us like this forever. Worship and conversing with God is what plugs us into an eternal source, not the one, the, not the sources on the earth that are running out. Entertainment gets old fashioned, wears out. Relationships are difficult. Brand new cars, they break, they get old, they get boring. Everything on earth that tries to satisfy our hearts wears out. This is the only place of eternal satisfaction. All of heaven operates in this continual satisfaction of supply, not just the material things we need, but wonder. You need wonder. You're actually made to need wonder. Fascination. Beauty. You're actually made to see beauty. That's why right now the hostages that are in Gaza, they're like, many of them, they think aren't seeing any daylight. They're not seeing anything but concrete walls and darkness. That's destructive to the human soul. We need to see light. We need to see beauty. We need to see purpose. We need to see joy. Wars and quarrels cease when we're satisfied like this. Enmity is addressed. Marriages get better. If you get fascinated in the house of prayer, your marriage will get better. And a lot of people are like, I can't do the house of prayer because my spouse doesn't want me to. Not realizing, oh, that's a satanic scheme to keep you from actually being a better spouse to your, to your spouse. We have to actually pray our way through these challenges because the enemy challenges us with our flesh, putting our flesh in the way so our flesh will tell us doing God's order will cost us too much. But that's not true. Doing God's order is everything we need. Okay. You're never going to get, you're never going to burn out actually doing the house of prayer for real. You can burn out going to houses of prayer though. You, you'll burn out if you go to the house of prayer and you don't see God there. <laughs> you will definitely burn out doing that because it's a hard place to be in the flesh. Uh, every need is met in this reality. Worship and connection to God is sustained in a very specific order. Okay. So this is Revelation 4, 6 to 11. This is the order I've been talking about this whole time. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. Now, when you see throne, you can know this is, oh, this is like the White House or the government of God. You know, this is like the center of the, where the decrees are made right here. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. So the, the government of God is a seeing government. It's actually based on seeing something. And when Sam and I were at a prayer meeting last night, we just kept praying, God, to let open our eyes, help us to see, let us see the one thing we need. Let us into this secret place of the tabernacle. Let us come in and be changed. We kept praying, show us your face and take us into the holy place. That's what this is about. So it's, it's a seeing government, right? And a declaring. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth, fourth living creature was like a fly, flying eagle. Heaven is incredibly diverse. I mean, if you really think about this, the sounds that are happening in heaven, they would sound a lot like a jungle. The, the, what it looks like. It might even be terrifying a little bit to see an eagle and a lion and and a man all circling, covered in eyes, declaring the holiness of God in these bellowing voices and these screeching voices and these human voices. I mean, it's dynamic <laughs> is the best way to say it. Um, the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. They do not rest day or night, saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So they're seeing things about who God has been, who he is right now, and who he's going to be. And they're declaring it. These are governmental decrees being declared, not because God says, okay, this is what everyone's going to do. That's not the way the, the government of God works. The way the government of God works is God shows what he likes. And those who love him see it. And they declare, this is what God is like. And those who love that throw down their crowns. They cast their responsibilities, their dominion down. They exchange what they want to do and what they think they can do for what God is and what he was and what he's going to be. It's beautiful. I mean, if you could really touch this, you'd be so excited about the rest of your life. I'm, I'm getting so excited about the rest of my life, just studying this and talking to you about it and writing out these notes. Okay. So it says, Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him. They plug in, right? That's what that means. When the seraphim plug in, they, the elders hear that they plug in. They worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns. Now your crown is your, well, I'll get to that in a second. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, you're worthy, O Lord. Okay, I, I, I see the seraphim saw this in you. I'm saying you're worthy to have 
everything I was thinking, everything I was going to do, everything I'm responsible for. I exchange my will for yours. I exchange my thoughts for yours. I exchange my heart for yours. And I know that everything I'm responsible for is safe if I just get into you. Okay. You're worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things. Nothing we have isn't didn't come from you. And by your will, they exist and were created. Jesus is part of this worship intercession. That's when you read about him, they can continue on intercession. This is what he's a part of. The crowns are responsibilities and dominions. There are many voices taking turns declaring what God is in the throne room. Whatever he is, it spreads through what he made by worship and intercession. Worship is contagious. You see somebody really seeing God. You, your heart is provoked to see something in God as well. Now, it's very tempting when we find that to plug into the person that's plugging into God because we feel more alive when that happens, but that's a counterfeit. We want to take somebody else plugging into God and do what the seraphim do and the elders do. We want to cast our responsibilities, our lives, our vision, our wants, our needs at the very same feet that somebody else is and then let him do something unique through us like the eagle does this, the lion does this, the land, the, the ox does this. They're not trying to you know, the eagle's not trying to be the ox and the ox isn't trying to be the man and the elders aren't trying to be the seraphim. They're just all finding their meaning and purpose being connected to God. That's what that's what our goal is in, in going to church and living our lives. We're created to make continual intercession because we're created to bring order to God's creation. Just stay with me for a second on this. I know that might be a little bit confusing, but the truth is, we were made to do what I just described happening in Revelation 4 because we were actually made to bring order from that throne room into everything that God made. Genesis 1, 27 to 28. So God created man. This is why you were made. In his own image, your God kind. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So it's men and women. Everybody's invited to this. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that was on the earth. He took them, he put them in a garden, a place where he had already cultivated it, set it all up, like ordered it. If you've ever seen a forest turned into like a garden, you're like, oh, there's still stuff alive. It's got some of the same colors, but oh, there's a pattern here. Somebody designed this. And he wanted Adam and Eve to take that garden design in his leadership and multiply and spread it over creation and turn the entire thing into a garden. He wanted us to subdue a creation that was unordered by this worship order. Psalm 37, 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. Now, in contrast, most of the church does things any way they want to. They find a good idea that other people like. They're like, oh, this is a great model. It's popular with people. And so we're going to do this to try and reach people and don't realize that's lawless. That's not the order of heaven. The, the order is the point, not the results. The results, if we look at Jesus living in the order of God, he ended with 11 guys listening to him and all of them went away from him and betrayed him at the very last moment. The, the results are not the point. It's the, the, the end is not the point. God's going to get the end. It's the means to the end that matter to us. We're supposed to come up into the order. It's narrow. Few are going to find it. So if you look at the church, you're like, well, everybody does it that way, Tom. That's mega churches are built by appealing to men's flesh. And God would say, I'm going to reject all of that. That's all going to burn in the lake of fire. I'm looking for people that want the order that comes with a cross. People won't understand it. People will reject it. It's uncomfortable for people's flesh. People don't like it. It's a washing machine. It actually requires a humility to say, I've got to change. I don't want a church experience that's catered to who I already am. I want a community of people that are all trying to change and be ordered by God into a humble, meek, lowly people that the world doesn't understand, but can't resist the truth that they know God. Okay, and that's what we read about in the book of Acts. Now, Psalm 37, 23. Order is the point. You're only going to find this if you're willing to come out of man's order and into the order of God. And that's weird because there's a war against it. Okay, and we'll get into that um, next week. Psalm 37, 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Now, all of this order will find its home on the Temple Mount. That's why we're talking about it in this Temple Mount series. The whole point of the Temple Mount is this order I've been talking about for the last 40 minutes. First Chronicles 25, 1-6. to 6. 
Moreover, David and the captains of the army separated for the service some of the sons of Asaph, of Heman, and of Jedathan, who should prophesy with harps, string instruments, and cymbals. And the number of the skilled men performing their service was, and then it gives, gives this list of people, and then if you look at verse 2, according to the order of the king, the king is David. And you're going to see throughout this whole passage, now I've read this passage to you probably three or four times at this point, so I'm not going to go through the whole thing again, but this is describing a worship order that David established in Israel when he became king of a united Israel and when he took over Jabus and turned it into Jerusalem, the place God had chosen. Okay, so this is a worship order that David established. Now, David's tabernacle was more than a good idea. It was more than an offering of love. It was the worship order given to man from heaven. David told us in the word that God taught him the tabernacle of David. It was. Now, this is the, these are the basics. This is the pattern. It was antiphonal. That means that there were many voices in harmony. David was the greatest musician in Israel, according to the Bible. He played his guitar and demons literally fled Saul. But he wrote songs and gave them to another musician because he cared about this order more than he cared about how amazing it felt or how all the demons would flee away. He wanted, he wanted to order Israel under God. This is so important. It's musical. The government of God is musical. And I give you a couple of passages here about A, the sons of God singing when God created the earth. And then you can see this passage in Ezekiel 28 about Satan, how he was actually a worship leader and that his governmental role in God's government before he fell was a uh, musical. The government of David, which was the tabernacle of David, it was centrally located. It was God-centered. And people had to come from across town or across the country to one central location. Now, right now, there's a move in the church to church from home or do church online, to do church conveniently. God's order is specifically inconvenient to the flesh. You ha he doesn't want an offering that costs you nothing because he wants to get you out of your self-order, out of your self-leadership. So if you're like, I don't need to go all across town to go do that. I'll just do it from home. I'll do it in my bedroom. You can't because it doesn't disrupt your flesh's leadership. It's centrally located. It's God-centered, not selfish or human-centered. It's prophetic. It requires information from heaven. This is I'm describing the tabernacle of David, but I'm also describing the temple mount, what's supposed to belong in the temple mount. And I'm also describing the revelation for throne room in heaven. Jesus is going to join all this together in one. It's Israel-centered. It's focused on the center of creation and the location that he has chosen. So God is the center of creation. God picked a spot, right? We talked about that the first week. So the real order is Israel-centered. It's Israel-focused. It's actually praying for Israel realities. And I wish I had, I, I've done so many series on the relationship with Israel and the church. Like, I'm not going to reteach it all right now, but if you get this part, you will pray for Israel most of your life. <laughs> and you will see actually that your life is in Zion. Okay. Now it's also expensive. It requires God's provision. It requires more than man could do. For it to be pleasing to God, it requires more resources than you have. Okay. And that's what opens our heart to receive the generosity of God and flow it into the earth. Now, I want to read you a couple passages. This is the worship that will bring agreement between heaven and earth. This tabernacle of David worship. Jesus will have his throne in this worship order. It's guaranteed. He will, it is guaranteed that the night and day, the, the church that survives the tribulation is going to be a night and day tabernacle of David praying church. Now you can see a war against that right now. You could be like, Tom, IHOP is gone. It doesn't matter anymore. All this stuff is falling. I want to tell you that is a lie of Satan. What God is doing is threshing and winnowing the prayer movement. And what's going to remain is an ordered, loving, First Corinthians 14, one person brings this, another person brings this, another person brings this order that Jesus is going to present to his father. You might not think it's big. You might not think it's impressive. That's the point. It, it's not supposed to be impressive to your flesh. It's ordered for God, and then he's going to grow it forever, and it's going to take over all of creation. So don't be short-sighted, and don't be fleshy-minded, and don't think God uses the wisdom of men to bring his kingdom to earth. You have to know what's happening right now in IHOP and in the Night Day Prayer, Prayer Movement is the most glorious thing to ever happen to it since Israel became a nation again in 1948. He is winnowing it and making it pure. That's amazing. That's good. Don't get out of it right now. It's now is the time to get into it. Okay. So 
Isaiah 16, verse 5, In mercy the throne will be established, and one will sit on it in truth, in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking justice and hastening righteousness. That's talking about Jesus. Jesus is going to rule on a throne. That's a capital O in the word one, verse 5. And it's in the tabernacle of David. The throne of Jesus is going to be in this worship movement, in this prophetic, antiphonal, musical, centrally located, Israel-centered, expensive worship movement. That's where Jesus' throne is going to be forever. Amos 9, 9 to 11, for surely I will command him, sift the house of Israel among all nations. That's happening right now. His grain is sifted in a sieve, yet not the smallest grain shall fall to the ground. Not anybody who wants this order has got it made. It's okay. You can live in all the shaking if you're letting it bring you to the place of peace. The place of peace is the order of God, the worship movement that reflects the government of God on earth. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword who say the calamity shall not overtake or confront us. They don't change. On that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and repair its damages, and I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. So when you see Israel being shaken among the nations, and you see the prayer movement being shaken at the same time, you can be guaranteed what he's really doing is rebuilding the tabernacle of David, raising up its ruins, repairing its damages, and he's rebuilding it as in the days of old. He's rebuilding it meek, lowly, completely dependent on God, and a group of people who don't want to go change the world. They want to be ordered so they're ready for Jesus to come back. Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. Now, if you read the Psalms, you will, that's what you'll see. Is a group, is a, a bunch of songs about people being ordered, not a bunch of songs about people changing the world. That was never the right vision. Like we pray night and day and we create a missions movement and go change the world. That's a wrong vision. But it's a right order. It's a right reality. If we can just strip away all the flesh and say, wait, that immature thing that we can see growing in the earth right now, let's get into the maturing of it, into caring about what Jesus cares about, not what man cares about. Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Obviously speaking of Jesus. And the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God. These are crowns. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. Men are going to get this done. No. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. God are, it's predestined. If you get into the order, this is your predestined eternal reality of being part of an ever increasing garden expansion movement that brings satisfaction to everybody who takes part in. Now, right now, Jesus is waiting for his bride to find the order that he will present to the Father. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 28. Then comes the end. This is what Jesus is doing right now. He's actually looking for anyone willing to be humbled, get out of what they thought they were got saved for, and get into what he wants right now. And he wants his throne on the Temple Mount right now. That's what he's waiting for. That's what the Father's waiting for. And they're both waiting for, and the Holy Spirit's waiting for us to get a clue and start saying, okay, God, get me into this. I don't even, I'm, I'm accepted in the beloved, but I'm not good at this. I don't even know what it's about. Get me into this order. I want to be changed in my heart. I don't want to make church about me or winning a city or winning the world. I want to make your kingdom. I want to be available for it to win me right now. Okay, so 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 28. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he's put all the enemies under his feet, all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death, for he's put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it's evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. That means the Father is going to be over the Son who is over a government that is run upside down by the Father and the Son and the Spirit, feeding into the growth of everything that the people he made get to take part in ordering the creation that he made as he gives them more and more revelation and satisfaction and joy and provision and resources and ideas. And he sends them out and brings them in and sends them out and brings them in. That's what David did. David did this in Israel. 24,000 singers, musicians, and gatekeepers came in and went out and came in and went out, saw God in that place. They were changed in the complete location, the geography of this place we're at right now, Jerusalem. It went from broken and disordered and lawless under Saul to being one of the most amazing kingdoms the earth has ever seen. The most amazing kingdom the earth has ever seen. That To this day, the nation of Israel longs for a king like David. They're looking for a people that do this right now. This is the witness that is going to reach Israel. 
This is the, when we say your God reigns and we're doing this order thing at the tabernacle of David, they'll be like, that's our destiny. That's our inheritance. How did you find it? We're going to say we found it through Yeshua Messiah. And he's given us his spirit. Come, take part. It's going to happen. I guarantee it's going to happen. Okay. So the, the kingdom coming and his will being done on earth is something we do. So when you pray, our Father who art in heaven, let your kingdom come and your will be done. When we pray that immaturely, we pray like, okay, come and fix abortion, come and fix crime. That's not that what that prayer is about. That's not what Jesus taught. That prayer is, let that kingdom come right here inside. Let your will be done right here. He said the kingdom's coming not in the ways to be seen. It's within you. Okay? When we, when we do it, something we do is we deal with his enemies inside of us. Our selfishness, our unwillingness to be moved, our unwillingness to go to a central location, our unwillingness to be musical, our unwillingness to be prophetic, our unwillingness to be embarrassed, our unwillingness to be ashamed, our unwillingness to be weak, our unwillingness to be wrong, our unwillingness to be evil people that need a savior. He's dealing with all those enemies, our fear, our shame, our anxiety, our uncertainty that he's a great God who's always taking good care of us. These are the enemies that are purged out in this order of the tabernacle of David. That's what it means when you read Psalm 24 and it says, who could ascend the hill of the Lord? Who could ascend the mountain of God, the temple mount? Only you has clean hands and pure heart who hasn't offered his, up his soul to an idol, who does this wrestle like, like Jacob did, who became Israel. He wrestled with God and found out who God was and found out who he was. He got changed. He got changed into Israel from being Jacob. This is what we do is we deal with his enemies inside of us. We humble ourselves under what he wants. We weren't saved to get a good life. We weren't saved to get eternal life led by us, to get some paradise that's not actually paradise. Everybody who tries to live life the way they want to ends up addicted, miserable, and alone. <laughs> like that's Paradise is not that. It's not doing whatever you want to. Paradise is doing whatever God wants to. And I'm telling you, this is what God wants to do. We begin being fitted together as living stones with a vision of his throne on the Temple Mount. If you want that, if you want to just take the next step into the order, not your order, his order, out of your self-leadership, I want to pray for you. Holy Spirit, I'm asking, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, who sits on a throne forever in the tabernacle of David, would you show us the order of worship you're looking for, the order of intercession, the order of prayer, the washing machine of sanctification of corporate living in night and day prayer with you. Not that we would pray all day and all night, but that we would see the need for a community of people that do. Or that it'd be a light burden, easy yoke to us in our minds as we look at it, that we'd see this is the source of light, not life, not the killer of life. That we'd see that for those of us that are doing night and day prayer right now, and it feels like a burden, would you show us that we need to repent, that that's not actually your order? Lord, for those of us that are doing it and we're getting filled up in it, would you strengthen us in confidence that as enemies attack that with lies, that we know that we've tasted and seen that the Lord is good in this place. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.